Hello, everyone. Cade Mila Falcha, you're very welcome to another annual Fela Bridge gathering. Uh, we're joined from all over Ireland and indeed all over the world. Many of you are regulars to the annual Fela Bridge event in Kildare, and many of you joined us last year for our what we thought would be our first and final online Fela Bridge. But here we are again. But there is mostly no doubt that we will be together in Kildare again next year but there is no getting away from the fact that there are some benefits to having our virtual gathering in the way that we're having it in that we're joined from people joined by people all over the world friends of Afri people that have been long term members of the Afri community people that are part of the work for peace, for justice, for sustainability, and also new friends of AFRI, people that are new to the organization, new to the community, but are also just passionate about the issues and involved in your own way. So you're all very welcome, no matter where you're coming from or how you've ended up here. You're, we'd love uh, for you to join the chat facility if you're joining us on Zoom, and indeed the comments facility if you're joining on uh, Facebook Live or on Facebook Live. So at the moment, we have well over 100, we have 130 something people in Zoom, and we have many more joining by the second and the same on Facebook. So it looks like we're going to have a good couple of hundred people here. And this is so important at this moment here on our planet, because as we know, the fog of war is hanging over us in around Europe. Uh, between on the border of Ukraine and Russia. We know that militarism and warmongering is in the air, and we know that the climate is in peril, and not just the climate, but our very existence on this planet. So our gathering is important to hear, to connect, to learn, and to inspire and mobilize each other. Uh, we have some incredible speakers. Uh, we're honored to have just some of the finest speakers joining us as well and also some fantastic music really really world-class lineup so it's an absolute honor for me to be your MC and your host my name is Rory McKiernan and I'm joining from a very very wet windy and wild uh, La Hinch County Clare and I'm really hoping that my internet holds up solid and that in, and my house holds up solid because the wind is really howling outside here so um, I'm just going to uh, bring on screen Joe Murray, who is uh, the coordinator of AFRI. People will know him or may not know him, and he's just going to give a short welcome as well. Thanks very much, Rory, and Kid me la falcha, riv got dinner. It's really brilliant to see so many people joining and from so many parts of the world. So you're all very welcome, and I'm sure you will benefit from this next hour and a half that we look forward to spending together. Um, it's just, it's the first um, fellow region we've had since we, since the death of our patron, Desmond Tutu. People may have seen him there in the, in the film beforehand. So we remember him, especially uh, at this fellow region. We had a, a wonderful tribute to him uh, just after Christmas, after he died. And that was a great gathering of like-minded people again. And I think that really the message then is that we must keep his flame burning. And today is about that as well. It's the flame of Bridget, it's the flame of justice, it's the famous flame of peace and sustainability. And we welcome you all in joining us in, in continuing his great legacy. And thank you, Rory, for hosting once again. Thanks very much, Joe. So we'll be hearing from uh, Joe a little bit later. But for now, as I mentioned, that uh, this is a gathering that usually takes place in Kildare, which is well known as uh, a place of Bridget or St. Bridget. And this year is a very special year. It's, it's the time of Bridget. Uh, we've just passed over Bridget's Day a couple of days ago. And Bridget's very much in the news, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but also the symbolism of Bridget in Irish tradition and culture as a peacemaker and a poet and a healer and indeed uh, a warrior for justice. So we're going to go now live to Kildare to a great friend of Afri. We're going to the Sullis Bridge Centre and we're going to, uh, in a moment, welcome Rita Minahan uh, to arrive with the Bridget Flame and to officially 
um, welcome and begin our event today. everybody we have people here all over Rita I'm just going to have a quick look uh, we have Dublin we have Galway where else Arizona West Cork Galway France well Windy Kerry Belfast Michigan USA Washington State uh, Monster Evan Carlo Valbriggan New York UK Arizona California how about that? Uh, I bet you never thought you'd be zooming the Bridget Flame all over the world like that, did you? Certainly didn't. That's a dream. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? And obviously um, the centre there has probably been curtailed or closed somewhat, but it, it's amazing how the message is getting out there still and you're connecting with all these people around the world, isn't it? It is. It is. It certainly is, Rory. And I feel so privileged to carry the Bridget Flame to the opening of AFRI's conference. The flame burns in Solis Frida as for the past 29 years, and it burns as a beacon of hope, justice, and peace for our country and our world. The story of the Bridget Flame, of course, began in 1993, when AFRI held an international justice and peace conference uh, to mark the 10th anniversary of its St. Bridget's Peace Crop cross campaign and it held the uh, conference in Kildare town and for that conference AFRI decided to relight the Bridget flame, a flame that had been burning in Kildare for over 1500 years and extinguished possibly sometime in the 16th century. And AFRI invited Mary Teresa Cullen who was the leader of the Bridgetine Sisters at that time to relight, to relight the Bridget flame. And I was there on that special day. It was just wonderful. There was tremendous excitement in Kildare town and a bowl of flame blazed over the town for the duration of the conference. Huge crowds came. I remember even a busload arriving from Derry for the opening of that conference. So we had great fun as well. I don't know what the locals made of it because Mary and Phil had only arrived in Kildare Town a few months before that. So we weren't very well known. And they heard when they heard AFRI was arising, arriving, they were awaiting a group from Africa to arrive, the Africans to come for the conference. So there was great excitement and we had a great conference. And at the conclusion of the conference, it was decided we just couldn't extinguish the flame. And uh, Mary and Phil took the flame and they have tended it ever since in their home in Solis Frida. So, uh, you know, it was really a great occasion. And the flame has been burning, as I said, for now 29 years. And just to mention, I could go on forever about this, but just to mention that we had three official presentations of the flame. The first was to our former president, Mary McAleese, when she came to Kildare Town. The second official presentation was to Richard Moore and Charles Innes, the soldier, in recognition of their work for peace and reconciliation and justice. And the third presentation was to the Dalai Lama when Richard, uh, if you like, hosted his visit to Andafri, his visit to Ireland in 2011. And he came to Kildare and was officially presented with the Bridget Flame. Uh, Rory, I just can't put into words the impact that this spark for justice and peace has had, the impact it has had since the relighting. It touched something very deep in the collective psyche. 
that people began to come from all over the world to see this little fragile candle flame, to sit with it. And, you know, it, it's just amazing. And, uh, you know, that's, as I said, it was carried to peace conferences. Uh, candles are lit from that little flame and are burning right across the world. Wow. This dead spark has ignited and will continue to ignite fires for justice and peace in many, many hearts around the world. And I would just like to maybe conclude with, uh, I read an article during the week and the author said, Bridget's story is a story for all time, not least because of her opposition to war and her fame as a peacemaker. So I think they're very, very powerful. And, you know, after when it held that conference in 1993, the title of it was Bridget, Prophetess, Earth Woman, Peacemaker. In hindsight, what a prophetic title, you know, especially as we see how Bridget is emerging in our world today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that Rita and I think you're right the the message and the, like the the image is often used of the the acorn and the oak but the the flame is such a powerful image as well for peace um and so you you mentioned Bridget arriving into the world and the message and the imagery around that and I think it's fair to say uh, next month there'll be a lot of attention given to a certain uh, other fella that's well known around the world uh, by the name of Patrick um, but I think uh, this year has made some new history in that uh, Bridget is now finally going to take her status on a more equal footing. And I would suggest that perhaps Patrick would need to watch himself uh, because she's coming. In, she's, he's got an early start on him by having a new public sure. holiday on the 1st of February from next year. So that must be a great thing to experience that news this year. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's, it's generated a huge amount of excitement. Bridget now stands shoulder to shoulder with St. Patrick, you know, as we go into the future. So I think that's wonderful in terms of gender equality in our world, even what it's saying to our world. Yeah. And, you know, 2023 next year is also going to be a huge occasion for Africa because it will be 30 years since the, the relighting of the flame in Kildare. So there are two things in 2023. And then, Rory, we're going to have another huge day a year in 2024 when Bridget 1500 is going to be celebrated, the 1500th anniversary of Bridget's death. So we have two great years ahead of us for you're celebration. Going to, you're going to be kept busy. <laughs> Thanks, Rita. Thanks. It was Thank great you. to chat to you. you and so we'll, much. we'll see you in person next year, if not Have before. a great conference. Take care. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to take a quick look here. We have, uh, we're heading for 200 people on Zoom and we've lots more on Facebook. So really coming together very well. Thanks everybody and thanks for your comments. Uh, I see Jack from Westmead, Mary Mount Melek, Mary Jo in Brussels. We have uh, Marjorie in Loud. I won't name everyone and everywhere. Eric in Leash. We have greetings uh, of peace from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, and that comes from the owner of an iPhone, whose name I don't have, but you're very welcome. To. And we have my brother, who is, uh, I just told him about the event just 10 minutes ago. So uh, thanks for joining. He's in China, in Kunming. So thanks for joining, Sean Oak. It must be late at night there. Uh, great, to, great to have you here. Uh, Alice in Leash, Maureen Kerry, uh, my own hometown in Kutil, Margaret, how are you? Uh, Dun Leary. Uh, Kevin Nace, Eileen, and it goes on and on and on. So thanks, everybody. It's great to, to get this gathering going. So now we're going to go uh, not too far from Cavan. We're going up to Longford and we're going to uh, welcome Kira Murphy, who works with the Jesuits, Jesuit Center for Faith and Justice. Um, how are you doing, Kira? How are you? Um, we'll just get the unmute going here. Um, one second. It's it's the it's almost like the word of the last two years. Can you unmute yourself? It's not very <laughs> poetic, is it? I can now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Great. How are you, Kira? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So, Kira, you're immersed in the world of biodiversity and sustainability and environmentalism. And before we get really stuck into to some of the issues and the, and the work that you do, can you tell me how how it came to be that you've ended up in this work? Like what 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 happened in County Longford mm -hmm. at, or was it after you left Longford or what were the influences or the, the things that motivated you to get involved in this work? Um, well, I suppose I've always, I've always been interested, I suppose, in sustainability and, and the, the natural environment. I think my mom <laughs> tells me stories from when I was younger when I was really annoying telling them to like turn off taps and stuff. But um, yeah, I was always interested and I kind of, I really liked science and I was, I was, I was like, I really liked the biology and the chemistry side of it. So it was kind of, I, it was, it just made sense, I suppose, to go to, um, to do environmental biology in UCD. So I did start that, I suppose, about only 15 years ago now at this stage. Okay. And in environmental biology, you do, you do a lot of ecology and you do, um, ecology of like the terrestrial systems and freshwater and marine and you kind of learn about biodiversity in general and a lot of theories but you don't learn about I suppose the justice side of things or the social side of things so um when I finished the undergrad I went straight into a postgrad and I did environmental microbiology and it was kind of halfway through the PhD that I realized that I I liked academia but I I kind of wanted to work in something that was that could that you could do tangibly to kind of we learned all about the I suppose the damage that was being done and the the degradation but we it was the work the work that I wanted to do I suppose was how, how to fix it it's like how do we bring together people to actually try and fix the problem so I suppose it kind of naturally led to it and then yeah. I think the main one, one of the kind of, I read um, Mary Robinson's book on climate justice actually before I started this job. And I think that was one of the books that kind of flipped the switch of this, like the stuff that I was interested in environmental, like um, I suppose health, it had a real impact. It kind of, it was that book that kind of made me see the, the linkages it had to social justice mm. so I yeah so I think immediately after I read that book I applied for the job in JCFJ so it worked out I brilliant it, it, it seems it struck me there that like you began that to some in some ways 15 years ago and like 15 years ago sadly uh, not everyone was talking about biodiversity or talking about nature and ecology but I think the world has come a long way um, and possibly sadly out of necessity or urgency and emergency, the fact that we have to talk about it now because things are in such a reckoning. And but it 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 almost like goes without it, it requires almost no explanation to ask why would anybody care now? But 15 years ago, and indeed those who studied and got involved decades, many decades before that, have helped kind of pave the way. And I suppose like a lot of the work has culminated recently in when the COP summit happened in Glasgow. And there's obviously a big spotlight gets thrown on the issues when these summits happen. And I know the work happens outside the summits for the most part, but it does put a big spotlight on it. I think you were in Glasgow, is that correct? At the, at the summit. Um, can, can you tell me uh, what it was like to be there? And did you set, what was the mood and, did you sense that we were on a, like at a turning point in a positive light or did you feel, how did you feel coming away from it, for instance? Um, yeah, we were there. We actually, it was, it was, it was nice. We were able to get the train and the ferry over because it was so close. Um, to be honest, I, <laughs> uh, COP was illuminating in quite a few ways in that before I went, it was, it does seem quite an opaque kind of system. You go in, like you don't really know what happens and there's a whole big festival and there's a whole big kind of mood I suppose around it that it is hard to know exactly what's happening but when I came away from it a little bit <laughs> not it was it kind of highlighted 
how bad the situation was and um I suppose it was I came away from it realizing that while COP was hugely important and it was completely necessary and it was it's it's one of the things that we we really can't afford not to get right we really can't afford for it to be the only mechanism of climate action um because by just by its design it is the lowest common denominator i suppose of of the ambition of all of the countries that are there mm. so it is the the minimum floor which needs to stand on so it is the it's it's kind of all the work outside so community groups and and lobbying corporations and national governments all of those things need to be done alongside the cop process for it to work um yeah so i think i came away from it realizing it was important but it wasn't the only horse in the race i suppose yeah and what what for instance for you would the day-to-day -day focus now be and where do you think the priorities lie in terms of creating the action and creating systemic change um well i suppose with my work in jcfj it is um the center it is we're quite lucky in the center in that we don't just focus on environmental justice we look at housing policy penal policy economic ethics and theology kind of wraps around all of it and the work in the center that we're doing is a lot of looking at how those different justice issues interlink so realizing that you you can't really have environmental justice without people being pulled out of poverty that sort of stuff so like without housing justice um so all of these injustices are kind of interlinked so the work that we're doing now um is mainly focusing on highlighting the interlinkages and kind of working from our yeah. own areas um uh, that, but that yeah a, a big mm, sorry that makes a lot of sense, particularly when you, you hear the ongoing debates about housing and, and energy and, and what type of car people have, unless it addresses the multiplicity of issues. Um, Kira, we don't have too much time um, because we have a full program to get through here, but I just want to uh, ask you a final question, and that is, um, you know, just around signs of hope and signs of optimism and what for you have you seen or, or what it what it, what is inspiring you that that change is possible and change is happening um i suppose i i tend to go back to what originally drew me into it and, and nature i suppose so when i when when i'm feeling a little bit hopeless i tend to look at rewilding projects <laughs> and be like looking at how nature can restore in it all of its complexity and that stuff that's damaged is it's not permanent or it's not always permanent so rewilding projects and even even regenerative agriculture projects i'm like they're those sort of community-based projects and and nature-based projects are what give me hope I suppose. brilliant and and there there's plenty of them plenty of examples and indeed there's there's people here in in the audience if you like that are doing amazing work and i would encourage anyone to use the comments or the chat to to promote your own work and keep an eye on afri for uh, future events that will be promoting some of the great activists and projects out there so thank you for the great work that you're doing kira and we look forward to to hearing what you get up to next and staying in touch and hopefully seeing you in Kildare this time next year yeah that'd be lovely thank you very much thank you okay folks um i'd love to chat to kira more and chat to everybody more but uh that I won't want to have you here for hours and hours and hours, but um, we're going to move along and we're going to go to um, a great friend at Afri also. It's uh, John McGuire and I'm going to invite John onto the screen now and we'll do the uh, customary ask to unmute. Um, I probably really will get sick of saying that later. John, how are you doing? Are you well? Uh, I'm well, thanks. Yes, I'm uh, and enjoying it. It's uh... Uh, I mean, it's a cliche to say it's a privilege to be at something like this, but it really is so moving and so wonderful. And I've, I'm have i lucky enough to have been in that wonderful centre down in Kildare on a number of occasions. It's wonderful to be in touch with it this way and to look forward to getting back there to Rita and the Light and Mary and Phil and all, all our friends there.
Well said, well said, John. Yeah. So, John, you are, uh, at least I know you as someone that very, very passionate and determined when it comes to the whole area of war, peace and militarism. And sadly, and it's something that AFRI and, and others, the New Stop uh, Coalition, have been highlighting this year in particular in that there have been some, uh, sadly, national government efforts towards further bringing Ireland into the war complex or apparatus, despite a proud tradition of peeping, people resisting that. So I'd ask you, John, to maybe talk about th that uh, interest and determination that you have, and also to maybe tell us a bit more about the Down Patrick Declaration, which you've been involved in, of course. Yes, well, th thanks indeed. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's best to start with the, the Down Patrick Declaration, and I know Rog can put up uh, not exactly the declaration, but um, an image of the summary version of it, which is on the front of the, the declaration. And I'll just say a little bit about it. I'd say people will read it faster than I'd recite it. And the Down Patrick Declaration has come from uh, the group uh, Swords to Plowshares, Stop. Uh, and we're a group who came together, I suppose, a bit over a year ago. Uh, in a way, uh, people with long records in the peace movement, in a way in reaction to some, as you say, very disturbing developments. Um, one of them, the initial one, was uh, where the British government gave money uh, for the building of drones, spirit drones, in a factory in Belfast. Um, and that struck us as being very uh, uh, hard to reconcile with Belfast's image as uh, the center of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Um, and then not long after that, while we were coming together as the group Swords to Plowshares, uh, the government in the Republic down here where I'm living in Dublin, uh, they held a webinar uh, actually promoting the idea of uh, developing weapons as central to uh, developing a modern and sustainable and viable economy. And we found that uh, extremely hard to reconcile with the values of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and indeed with the values of Article 29 of our constitution, all of which commit us, our governments and ourselves to democratic and peaceful and law bound uh, approaches uh, to conflicts. Uh, so we, uh, if you like, we were looking at the lack of link between what's been happening in, for example, our in involvement in the war on terror, um, NATO's war on terror, particularly through Shannon, and then developing weapons. The lack of link links between that and uh, the values that we've affirmed as, as, a, a, as a country, as an island indeed, in different ways. And that led us to see some uh, other links. Uh, they, if you like, there were missing links to our values, but also we saw the links, and if uh, uh, Rog might be able to put up the stop diagram here, it's actually a, a diagram which was developed a number of years ago by the Galway Alliance Against War. Uh, and they were drawing out, if you like, the connections, the dreadful cycle that happens between the production of weapons, the use of weapons for aggression, the displacement of persons, all the problems of deportation, et cetera, et cetera. And we realized that uh, we don't want to be uh, involved, caught up in that kind of destructive cycle. Now, whilst we're looking at that, that awful cycle, we can remind ourselves that not all is gloomy, because uh, through official Ireland, Irish aid, uh, and unofficial Ireland, and the connections between them, and we can look at a, a different uh, uh, image now, Rog, the image of the program that Irish aid has, uh, where it works directly and works along with NGOs and charities in promoting development in the wider world. Uh, and from that point of view, uh, we can see that things aren't all gloomy, that the light, the light of Bridget can be brought into the world. But at the same time, we've seen increasingly 
our NGOs, our charities, and others being dismayed by, uh, if you like, the fact that so often they're playing catch up, they're trying to rebuild after conflict and regretting the waste of human resources of mind and matter uh, that, that could be used for building a, a beautiful and sustainable world. So if you like, um, Swords to Plowshares has been working to measure what it occurred to me today would be our weapon footprint. That's a, a footprint that we have in the world and we're involved in it in Ireland. And indeed, measuring our weapon footprint is very compatible with what you were talking about just now with Kira, uh, which is measuring our carbon footprint, because we need to address both of those together. And indeed, we probably won't solve the climate crisis unless we can uh, deal with the huge amount of destruction uh, and waste uh, that comes from the creation and the use of weapons. So we want to reconnect with the values that we've affirmed. And they're not abstract values. They are statements of who we are and how we promise uh, to behave. But then I suppose people will ask the question, can we reconnect with our values and our promises? And is it safe so to do? Is it safe to reconnect with those values in a world we're told is so full of terrors and dangers? But I'd, I've been asking myself, and I ask our, our participants here, how safe have you felt in recent weeks and recent months? How safe emotionally, morally, even physically have we felt? And I've got this image that suddenly occurred to me that we have, I call them the gods of war, the would-be gods of war, these mighty and accessible powers. And they're playing a game of deadly Jenga. You know, that wonderful game you can play with children. Well, they're playing a deadly version of it with sharpened swords. You can see them saying, oh, there's a sword. Now, if we balance a sword against that, we just, just that will be all right. And we can get, and maybe we'll get another one in from the side. And this terrible canopy, if you like, of sharpened swords, of scimitars, is being erected over our heads. We hope it won't fall on our bodies, but in a way, it has already infected our minds. And I was struck there uh, when Rita was talking about how the light of Bridget addresses something deep in us. Well, maybe what it's doing is counteracting something that goes very deep within us as well. Uh, something that comes from what General Lee Butler, who used to be in charge of all the US nuclear weapons, came to identify and indeed has spent the rest of his life campaigning against as the nuclear priesthood. Maybe we've got a malign kind of a priesthood there. And I, though I would like to explore this further with people, and if they contact swords to plowshares, the details will be put up, we can extend this conversation. Uh, what's, what's happening is that these gods of war, they actually have put a certain kind of fear and a certain kind of stupor into our hearts and our minds. But is it possible to reverse this? Bridget is a great resource because she's very good at debunking patriarchal hierarchies. And she has a friend as well. And her friend is Patrick Kavanagh, the poet. And he reminds us to see ourselves as, as small as we really are, which is as great as God has made us. And then he says, but being males, they don't like my heir. In other words, that these male patriarchal hierarchies are very resistant to the light and the message of Bridget. But we can draw hope, not just abstractly, because we have seen the process work. We have seen a, pro a peace process here by people who said, no, we're not going to give in to the cycles of conflict. We're going to take the risks of peace. We're going to, as fragile humans, reach out to other fragile humans. And the great news is we're not God and we don't have to be gods. 
and we don't have to run the world because it's the people who think they can run the world at the interpersonal level, the societal level, the global level, those are the very people who end up preparing for war, threatening and often waging war. So it's actually a great relief, even for an old agnostic like me, to talk a bit of theology and say, okay, I realize I'm not God and we don't need to be gods and we don't need to run the world and we don't need to build a tower of peace that's bigger than the Tower of Jenga. We can bring our minds, we can bring our bodies down to earth where we can transform those swords into plowshares and live in a form of conviviality. And so we need, I think, a movement. We need action to come from our conversation and we need the action to become a movement. And if we don't want Ireland to be caught up in the kind of cycle that the Galway Action Diagram showed us there, and people can follow this up with me, as I say, if you want to make contact with swords to plowshares. If we don't want that, we genuinely do need a movement, a movement of people who say, look, we've decided in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, in Article 29 of the Irish Constitution, that we want to live peacefully, democratically, and legally. And I suppose I'll just draw to a conclusion, if that's all right, uh, with a number of sources from which I draw hope. And hope is different, as my old friend Herbert McCabe, the great Dominican philosopher and theologian reminded us, hope is different from both optimism and despair. Optimism is just reckoning something will turn up, so we don't have to do anything. Despair is reckoning there's nothing we can do. But hope is the modest approach of reaching out from our fragility to that of others. And it's from our creativity to the creativity of others. And knowing, as Václav Havel reminded us, that something can be worthwhile no matter how it works out. So maybe just a couple of uh, uh, closing notions uh, or voices of hope. I'm reminded of Rosa Parks, whose birthday was recently, the great Rosa Parks. And she said to us, if we don't stand up for something, we'll fall for anything. Now, I think we've fallen for far too much in recent decades in this country. And we have to look at the involvements already in wars on terror and the siren calls of producing weapons for a sustainable economy, however you think you could do that, uh, and to realize we can take action. But it, you know, it, it does require, I think, People, for example, reading the Dan Patrick Declaration, saying to their friends, isn't this, it's not news, it's a reminder of who we are. And I'll finish with a wonderful quotation I heard recently from someone talking about the game of Jenga at the moment over Russia and Ukraine. And it's a man, I think his name was Father Vitali. And someone was asking him, well, how are you in the middle of all this? And you know what he said? He said, well, close attention brings hope. So he was almost rejoicing in the fact that some of these tensions and conflicts were being looked at, and Bridget is the best person to shine light on them. So we can have resources of hope. We can make a modest contribution to the global peace process that the world, particularly the majority world, the global peace process is crying out for. Thanks very much. I hope that's uh, not too much of a rush. That was wonderful, yeah. John. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I love that phrase at the end, the majority world. We need to remind ourselves of that the majority of people yeah. stand for peace, want peace, mm. and, and will always do so, and that we can't allow the minority warmongering factions. So there was a great hope uh, coming true from you and your words. And you clearly have it strong in your heart, John. So thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Rory. Thank you all. Yeah.
take care okay john thanks um great folks so um again i could listen to john uh, for for lots more time um, but alas, we, we will keep moving on and I see more and more people joining us online. So you're all very welcome. I saw a few people had some technical challenges getting in with the links and so on. So hopefully you arrived in and you, you made yourself at home here in Zoom. But I know it can be frustrating when those little technical gremlins happen. And I'm not sure why they happen, but hopefully you're, you, you've all ended up here. Uh, safe and well and can breathe again after perhaps cursing at the computer or at least that's what I sometimes end up doing non-violently of course um, so um, we are going to move along I'm going to bring on to screen uh, Joe Murray again who is going to introduce a very special guest um, from well I let Joe do the introductions Joe um, we'll get you to do the honors of the unmuting Thanks very much, Uri, and thanks, John, and like loads of food for thought from Rita and John and uh, Kira. So, so great stuff so far. And um, I think we'll continue with that uh, trend now with, uh, with Richard Moore. Hopefully Richard is with us. Richard, Richard is there. You're on silent, Richard. And it's not too often you can say that to Richard. Hi, right, Todd. Now we can hear you. That's good. Loud and clear. <laughs> good to see you, Richard, and you're very welcome. Always welcome at AFRI events. That's I know good. you've been to Kildare a number of times. In 2010, as Rita referred to earlier, you and Charles came and were presented with the Flame of Bridget. You were there with the Dalai Lama in 2011, and in fact, you were there on a third occasion. So. Um, and, and this time we're, we're doing it virtually, but, but always a great pleasure to, to have you, Richard. And maybe to start by saying, you know, people are aware, especially after last weekend, that this is a very significant weekend in Derry, or a very significant year, in that it's 50 years since Bloody Sunday. And I know, and I'm not sure if other people will know, that that had a very direct impact on you and your family. And then 50 years since you yourself were shot and blinded, by by the soldier that Rita referred to earlier. So maybe just your thoughts and reflections on 50 years ago and, and what your memories are of, of that. OK, well, thanks very much, Joe, and thanks to everybody. It's great to be here. Um, and, you know, always delighted to be associated with AFRI and, and all and, and everything that you do, the amazing work that AFRI does. And uh, hello to all the, the sisters down there as well. Um, I, I mean, I suppose, you know, for me, uh, 1972 uh, was obviously a significant year in the sense that while I was on my way home from school, I um, was at the bottom of, of the school playground. I was 10 years of age at the time and uh, I, um, uh, Charles, the soldier, fired the rubber bullet that struck me on the, the bridge of the nose and, of course, I've been permanently blinded ever since and, uh, and and that year 1972 was probably among what was a well arguably the most violent year in the history of the Northern Ireland conflict you know and it all started with Bloody Sunday in many ways because the carnage that happened on Bloody Sunday here in the streets of Derry is something that has obviously plays quite a bit on, on all our minds really but particularly um, and the minds of people who live in Derry, and 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 it's an injustice that people will never forget. It was a terrible day, and as you mentioned, my uncle Jared was shot there that day, uh, which you know obviously had an impact on my mommy and my daddy, particularly. But my mommy's brother was shot there that day, and then four months later, or three months later, actually, I was blinded. All, at, I suppose, as a result of so-called legitimate forces. The British Army fired the rubber bullet uh, at me. The British Army shot the 13 people dead on Bloody Sunday. And, uh, you know, and these are all legally held weapons, as, as one might phrase it. And, you know, in circumstances where everybody was completely innocent. Uh, I was shot at the bottom of a school playground in an enclosed area. It wasn't a public, public thoroughfare. It was as exactly what it says. It was 20 past three in the afternoon. It was just as we got out of school. And um, 
I suppose the impact on me and my family of both incidents, but the particularly, you know, my being me being blinded, had an enormous impact on my parents. You know, when I can remember quite clearly the the the, the enormity and and the tragedy that my mommy and daddy felt. You know, I can remember when I got out of hospital and. I was lying in bed at night, and and um, my, my mommy was my mommy and daddy were two very devout Catholics who went to mass every day of their lives, and uh, you know, um, I remember my mommy coming up beside my bed, and she had enormous faith. She used to kneel down beside the bed, and and she would start to pray that you know, and and she thought I was sleeping, and and then she would break down and start to cry and the crying would get out of control and she'd be pleading with God to give me back my eyesight, you know, and she was saying things like, look at him, God, he's only a 10-year-old boy, please give him back his eyesight. Please give him back his eyesight. And, you know, i pretend to wake up and she would kind of pull herself together then. But, you know, um, and, and for me, Daddy, it had a very similar situation where when, when we were at the hospital and, and they told him that I was blind for the rest of my life. You know, there was something I discovered long after my daddy was dead and many years after the incident, 33 years after the incident or 34 years after the incident, that my daddy said to the doctors, you know, um, when they told him that I would never be able to see again, my daddy said, look, can I give him my eyes? And that was a man who was an unemployed shoemaker he had nothing to offer, money-wise or anything like that, other than his own eyesight for me. And I think that stands out in stark contrast to, you know, the actual firing of a rubber bullet and the process behind that. Um, for me personally, um, I bounce back quite well from being shot. And, and, and I am a very happy and contented blind person. I genuinely am. And anybody that knows me would know that. But it doesn't take away from the fact that there are times in my life when blindness has been a big challenge. And um, particularly when, um, you know, at, at, at significant times in my life, for example, when my two daughters were born, Neve and Enya, and I was in the ward when they came into the ward for the first time, and, you know, I could see them. When they were smiled for the first time, when they opened their eyes for the first time, any parent tuned in to this today would know that that is a magical moment in the lives of any parent. But I couldn't enjoy that. And that's denied to me for the rest of my life, you know. And I, my daughter, Enya, got married there a couple of years ago. And I knew that day would come. She'd walk up the aisle in her beautiful dress, and I'd be walking her up the aisle. And there was a sense of loss, you know, because I couldn't see her. I couldn't see her in her beautiful dress. And, you know, in that way, it's um, that's the legacy of war. That's the legacy of violence. And, um, you know, and sometimes I remember sitting in the Craig and Chapel when, when, when they made their first communions and their confirmations. And I remember thinking, you know, does a soldier ever think about me? Does he ever think about what happened that day? Does he ever think about what it meant for me for the rest of my life? And, and this all happened because of the firing of a so-called riot control weapon, a weapon that wasn't considered dangerous. Now, you know, you know, and I know every weapon is dangerous. Every weapon is lethal. And then many, many years later, in fact, about maybe six or seven years ago, I discovered that uh, it was the Pat Finucan Centre in Derry came across papers that were held in some government document in, 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 in London, where it was correspondence between the Ministry of Defence and their solicitors. And they were talking about me and at the time. And that evidence said that rubber bullets had proven to be lethal at that time. And they knew they were lethal. But they hid that information from the general public. And in one of the letters that the Ministry of Defence, Defence sent to their solicitor was, it said, under no circumstances is MERS solicitors to see this, or to find out 
that tests had been carried out and rubber bullets were proven to be lethal. So if anything, that proves the point that the people in charge of weapons, the people that so-called, you know, the so-called sort of legitimate forces or whatever, do not use these weapons in the way that they like us all to think. They don't use them under the circumstances that they're supposed to be used, and they don't use them to protect. And that was clear in that one sentence in that letter in order to cover up the injustice that happened to me. Richard, you have the bullet, do you? That... Yeah, I brought the bullet with me. Um, that, I, could you see this, Joe? Yes, I can right. see it. That's the, that's the actual bullet that hit me. So if you look at that, that goes under a gun like that, and it hits it like that, and out pops the bullet. That's the actual rubber bullet that hit me. Now, I'll put it beside my fist for people to get a sense of the size of it. Yes. And, you know, it must be six or seven inches long or whatever. And, you know, it travels at 100 miles an hour. And somebody somewhere made that bullet. Somebody somewhere carved it onto the point that it is and made it what and made that container that it goes under. And then down inside that container, there's a small igniter or whatever they want to call it full of gunpowder. So an innocent piece of metal, an innocent piece of rubber, and you have a lethal weapon. And maybe now, just on that point, Richard, to say, you know, what how do you feel then when you hear that the Irish government is starting to get involved in the weapons industry you know like it, it it has been to some extent in making components in the past but now it's becoming a fully fledged member of the arms production community if you can call it that uh, what does what way does that make you feel i'm horrified at it and i mean i think it's disgusting to be honest and i think that you know, Ireland's got such an incredible, and John was on earlier, talked about our, the overseas development and all that, which is, which I'm involved in through Children and Crossfire. And it's amazing the role that Ireland plays, uh, the positive role that Ireland mm. plays in regard to that. But then you look at this and you think, well, you know, are we beginning to separate the person that makes the bomb from the person that plants the bomb? Is that what we're trying to do here? You know, so if I make a bomb and I give it to you and you go and plant it and it kills people, then I have nothing to do with it. Are we going to export carnage and export misery throughout the world? Is that how we're going to improve our lives? Is that how we're going to, is that how our government is offering us a good standard of living? And, you know, that bullet there, would the Irish government recommend that businesses in Ireland get involved in the 1970s, making rubber bullets. Sure, that would have created employment in Dublin or Cork or Galway or wherever. That would have created employment. But would they have actually recommended that businesses in Dublin invest in making these? They fire them at children and people in Northern Ireland. I guess they wouldn't have done it. And why not? Because they wouldn't have wanted to be associated with that. But so why would you want to be associated with more lethal weapons that will kill children and maim children all over the world? You can't disassociate yourself because you're maybe a sanitized environment in a factory or, or an office somewhere in Dublin or Galway, as I say, and think this has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with me. If, if I am involved in making a weapon that is going to kill somebody, somebody's fingerprints is in this bullet. Somebody somewhere has their fingerprints in this bullet that blinded me. Somebody somewhere has their fingerprints in that. So in all honesty, I just would appeal to that spirit that we have in Ireland, spirit of generosity spirit of kindness, spirit of peace. And, and, and they, they not do that. They not get involved in this. And then also, like, you know, we've had a war 
in Northern Ireland, a 30-year war. Last week, as you, we had the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, which you mentioned. We had the Taoiseach and we had the Tanishta up here, planting, you know, and ceremonies involved in, you know, a reef ceremony and stuff in Derry, which was beautiful and lovely, and it's great to get that support. Now, do you not think that's in sharp contrast to them supporting a industry that is going to create more Bloody Sundays, that is going to create more Richard Murs, that is going to create more violence, as we saw in Northern Ireland. You know, how long did we camp campaign for, or did they even campaign for, for weapons in Northern Ireland to be put beyond use? How long did they campaign for that? Put weapons beyond use. How does that fit with a logic when now you're encouraging an industry to start making weapons? So what message are we sending out to those children and those communities and other parts of the world that are going to be at the, at the, end, the end of these weapons? That my life is more important than yours. Our lives is more important than your lives. And I think that's very sad. Yeah, I, I agree, Richard, and I think the issue is that, that disconnect that people think we make weapons, but we're not responsible for what happens afterwards. And sadly, in this case, is that most weapons are used in the in the global south, in the majority world. So, you know, that, in, uh, and, and as John mentioned earlier, Irish Aid are doing fantastic work in in the, in the global south, and then we have another wing of government, the Department of Defence, promoting the defence industry. But maybe just drawing to a conclusion, um, you know, it, it always amazes me that you weren't bitter, that you weren't angry, that your parents or, or your family weren't, um, you know, given what happened to you. And how do you explain that? Uh, well, I mean, I think any ideas of, I do forgive the soldiers who shot me and me and Charles are good friends now. And, uh, and, you know, I boil that down to my family and my parents particularly because in all the heartache that they had, and it was a lot of heartache, that they never, I never heard them say an angry word. I remember one of my brothers in the kitchen in our house just after I was shot and, um, uh, you know, he was having a go with my mommy really. And he was saying like, they blinded, they, they blinded Richard. They murdered my Uncle Jared. It's time to get my own back. And my mommy said to her, you know, or said to him, look, you're not, you're not helping Richard by hurting somebody else. And if you want to help Richard, go on there and help Richard. And I mean, that was, I believe I get my, my um, ideas of forgiveness and, and lack of anger in my life from them. And I'm really, really grateful for that. And, you know, I bounced back really well and obviously went on to setting up children and crossfire and stuff like that, which is, you know, obviously doing some of the work that you talk about that Irish Aid supports and other parts of the world. But I, I keep saying, you know, that the reason why children and crossfire exists is not because of me, really. It's because of that love and compassion that my parents showed me, that my teachers showed me, that my friends showed me in terms of supporting me at the times of my life when I needed. And I'm still, I still receive support and help from people every day in my life because I'm blind. And I just think that, you know, that's a lesson in itself as well. And what we don't want is to bring up a community, a society that gets other influences, that thinks it's all right they do what the Irish government's proposing at the moment, because then we are we are uh, developing a society that whose mind is being disconnected from their heart. Richard, that's fantastic. I was hoping to talk to you a lot more about the work of Children Across Fire. I know it at first hand. I was on the board for a long time, and I know the fantastic work that you do. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. 
Oh, that's it's fair. Always brilliant uh, to talk to you, Richard. Thank you, Joe. Story. It still moves me, and I've heard it hundreds of times. But <laughs> it's fantastic to, right. to have you as part of our fela, and uh, we might have you back for part two in the next, when we're back in Kildare next year. That's no problem. Any time at all. I'm delighted to be here, and hello to everybody that's tuned in as well. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Joe, and uh, thanks, Richard. So, folks, it's uh, it's it's kind of hard to move on from that because, uh, it, like me, I'm sure you you've been very moved by what uh, Richard has been sharing and his testimony and his his courage and the fact that he remains not just the man that he is. He's also wild crack. I had to actually tell them two lads to behave themselves. Well, I told Joe anyway. I said, look, you have 20 minutes here. There's to be no messing. <laughs> because, we were very professional. Oh, here, there he goes. I, he's, I have to mute him. <laughs> but uh, they're, they're two great men to, to have the crack. And one of the things I really admire about Richard um, is that he emits great joy. And it's something that I was really struck by. Um, I mean, just type into Google images, Dalai Lama, Richard Moore, and the photos you'll see, the pure crack and divilment among them. But I uh, remember we had the, the Desmond Tutu tribute event at Christmas, and then we watched the documentary on Desmond Tutu. There's something about people that are invested in the work and have experienced firsthand um, injustice and hardship, but yet have still have hope in their heart and still have the ability to shine and to smile and to share love. And those people, I think, need to be cherished and honored. And those are our leaders in my eyes. Those are the people that I take my inspiration from. And I know that that many have shared the same view as well. So I really, really would encourage you to check out Richard's work, um, childreninCrossfire.org. And I have a link ready to share in the chat box if you're on Zoom. And it's a short documentary. It was aired on TV years ago. I hope I'm legally allowed to share this, Richard, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's, the, it's a UTV documentary, The Dalai Lama's Hero, but sure they can sue me, they won't get much. <laughs> anyway, I've shared that link. It's on YouTube anyway. It's called The Dalai Lama's Hero. And Richard's also uh, known as the Dairy Lama. He has many names <laughs> and credentials. So... Thank you again, Richard. And um, to, to carry on with that um, sentiment, the work of peace, the work of justice, um, which is permeating today's event and permeating um, AFRI's work. Um, music has always been an important part of AFRI's work, uh, both as a, a means to reflect and to tune in and to connect. And um, there's, there's probably, I can't think of anybody better at the moment to, to join us in song um, than the legendary folk singer Tommy Sands, uh, a great county down uh, man who is now uh, up, I believe, joining us uh, from Donegal, if he is here. Tommy, uh, how are you doing? We'll just get the old mute thing going there. Good man. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rory. I, I, I'm county down, but I'm up in Donegal, as you say, for, for a few days. Uh, little hideout up here which i love and uh, what, are you, what are you hiding from tommy oh <laughs> no, I ask? that's a good question that's a good question. <laughs> or what are you looking for but i i can imagine like the depth of your songwriting tommy having listened to you over the years i can i can see why you would would have a place of perhaps solace and solitude and maybe tune in a wee bit because those songs don't come from nowhere and um, they're they're really powerful things. So I won't say too much more, but I'm really looking forward to to you sharing some of your your beautiful songs. Thank you very much, Rory, and and I'm delighted to be here and part of this wonderful event. I'm very very moved by Richard and such a, a beautiful person and a powerful man, and indeed everyone who's been on the program. And I'm looking forward to the rest of it. Uh, yeah, you didn't see me, but I, I see you. Uh, I, I listen to everything and uh, really enjoying it. But it, I suppose I was going to sing another song, but after listening to Richard and indeed Joe suggested I sing this one. I suppose sometimes you have to revisit history and 
reimagine tradition, rewrite songs. There was a song that many of us grew up with, written by Bob Dylan called The Answer is Blowing in the Wind. But I was a little bit worried with that song in the sense that very often people interpreted the song as why is there war? We don't know. The answer is blowing in the wind. But in fact, the answer is not blowing in the wind at all. It's right before our eyes very often. A few years ago, I noticed on social media where when David Cameron went to Egypt during the Arab Spring uh, period, and he went to give a lecture on democracy to this fledgling uh, uh, new uh, project. But he brought with him seven arms dealers. And I thought, the answer is not blowing in the wind. The answer stares you in the eyes. The answer is not blowing in the wind. And the question whispers in my mind. Take another look around behind the headlines. The answer stares you in the eyes. The answer stares you in the eyes. And how many times can a cannonball fly before there be forever banned? Will it fly just as long as there's fortunes to be made by the wheelers and the dealers of arms? And fellow profiteers who manufacture fear to ensure that their wars will survive. The answer is not blown in the wind no more. The answer stares you in the eyes. The answer is not blown in the wind. And the question whispers in my mind. Take another look around behind the headlines. The answer stares you in the eyes. The answer stares you in the eyes. And how many years can a mountain exist before it be swept to the sea? How many empires to solve in the mist and the sea? There's nothing more to steal. Invading, persuading that God is on their side. Though God knows it's far from their mind. The answer is not blown in the wind no more. The answer stares you in the eyes. The answer is not blown in the wind. And the question whispers in my mind. Take another look around behind the headlines. The answer stares you in the eyes. The answer stares you in the eyes. times can the truth be disguised in the guise of some patriotic lie? The media controlled, for they do what they're told, embedded in body and mind. But the truth has escaped past the centuries at the gate, a new way to news we can find. The answer is not blown in the wind no more. The answer stares in the eyes. The answer is
is not blowing in the wind. And the question whispers in my mind. Take another look around behind the headlines. The answer stares you in the eyes. The answer stares you in the eyes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tommy. Thank you. That was really powerful. And we'll be back to you again, Tommy, shortly before the end of the event. Thank, thanks for that powerful song and reflection stories. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Okay, folks. And from, uh, from, County, from Derry to Down to Donegal, uh, you're not going to guess where it would be next. It's not somewhere beginning with D anyway. We're going the whole way. Well, maybe it is actually, because I don't know the exact name of the place that I'm tuning into, but we're going all the way to Kenya now. And uh, I'm just going to double check that Abjata Khalif is with me here. If everything goes to plan. Hello, Abjata. How are you doing? We'll just get the mute going there. I'm, you... really, I'm doing well and uh, I'm happy part of uh, this uh, gathering thank you for joining us Abjata. can you just tell us exactly where you are in the world and and is it somewhere beginning with d perhaps it doesn't really matter at all but i'm just curious if you can set the scene of what part of the world you're in well um uh, i am in um, northern kenya a place called gariza and uh, in gariza it is a county in kenya bordering lawless somalia and uh, I remember Gariza was in international news when uh, uh, the, the, the Islamist, the Islamist uh, terrorist called Al Shabaab attacked a university some years back. Yeah. And they massacred 42 students in cold blood. And uh, that could be avoided if, uh, if, you know, if there was a stringent, stringent measure in addressing illicit transfer of small arm and light weapon which falls into hand of dangerous people. So I come from that county, which was uh, in, in the international limelight some years back. Mm. Uh, and apart from that, the same county and the same region I come from in Kenya, it is a dry land region, and it has experienced a lot of insecurity, a lot of armed attacks, and a lot of massacres, a lot of a number of ed ethnic cleansing, and all that, is fueled by constant supply of small arm and light weapon, which comes from Somalia. It is it is smuggled from Somalia, which is lawless. There's no government there. But the source of those illicit arm comes from Eastern Europe, mm. and some also come from Western Europe. And it is uh, smuggled from uh, from uh, uh, African government. You know, there's high level corruption in Africa. So some uh, security forces they they sell the same arm. And it end up it end up in hand of wrong people, and uh, by by doing that, it contributes to mass killing, ethnic cleansing, massacre, displacement, conflict, rape, and many other things. So that's the region I come from, and uh, that's where I'm joining this gathering this evening. Abjada, um, can you can you just take us back to um, just when you were a little bit younger? I know you've uh, become. Uh, a journalist and very much recognized for your work as a, as a journalist. But um, before you got involved in journalism, can you tell me just how conflict affected your own personal life and then how that led you into journalism? Well, uh, uh, I hail from um, uh, a small village called uh, Wagala. And uh, while I was young, you know, there was a number of attack, att armed attacks targeted at our village and other villages. And I remember very well, many, you know, on, on many occasions, uh, we had to, you know, uh, as, as young children, we were taken out, uh, outside our village, taken to the main town, staying there for almost uh, three or four months to wait for things to come down. Apart from that, I saw firsthand uh, armed attackers, uh, torching houses, beating people, raping women, be, uh, you know, beating young children using gun butts and all and uh, and other crew weapon. And apart from that, uh, the biggest or the you know the biggest the the biggest turning point to my life was when 
the you know the uh, occurrence of a, a, a large scale massacre in our in, in in my village of Wagala, whereby estimated three thousand people were killed, and people were forced to sleep on uh, you know on a dry tarmac on 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 a dry tarmac for almost three days without food and water, and I remember very well I lost my sister there, and uh, some of my family member up to now they have lifetime injury, you know others are bedridden. And th th that one happened in 1984. And from and th that time I was very young, but I remember vividly what happened. And that one shaped my life. And I asked myself, what can I do? And uh, uh, you know, what type of change can I bring? And uh, how can I become an agent of change? Those are the big questions, uh, you know, which uh, assisted me in shaping my career, in shaping my activity and my everything. And by doing so, I ended up in taking a journalism course whereby I went back to my community and started a community media project uh, to educate them, to empower them, to, you know, to mobilize them, for them to understand their right, for linking them to justice system, linking them to government institution and uh, reporting violation, human rights violation, women rights violation, and other outdated cultural practices like wife inheritance, like uh, female G FGM, that is female genital, mutilation and also early and forced marriage so the that is the contribution i made but i uh, you know i was shaped by the number of the attacks the massacre the killing the death of my sister the you know and some of my relatives who are left bedridden up to now as i'm talking to you know as, as i'm talking to to you know to to, to all of you they are bedridden but uh, that one shaped me it shaped many and I joined hand, and the most interesting, the most interesting thing is, I joined hand with other, you know, with other, you know, with other young boys and girls from uh, from villages affected by armed conflict. We joined hand, and we asked ourselves, what can we do? So it was not me alone, you know. It is, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, you know, it was a group of, of of young young students who came together and asked ourselves, what can we do? Can we see? This community going on like this, armed conflict going on like this, large scale massacre going on like this, like this. What can we do? What is our contribution in in in, in a small way? What can we do? So we came together, and as I'm talking to you right now, we have a fully fledged community radio which reports all issues. It is heard, and the government will normally take action because it is a very powerful channel. It's a very powerful platform, and it's the same platform which offers education. It also reports early and first child marriage when a young girl uh, you know and uh, uh, when a young girl from age age five or six is taken out of school to be you know to you know and uh, is forced to marry an old man the case is reported it's heard through the media and the government institution take it takes action and you know that one has assisted very much in contributing to social justice in empowering community in reporting movement of people armed people from one village to another, and they are intercepted. You know, they are fought back or they are arrested, they are apprehended, and action is taken against them. So that platform has worked very well, and I wish the same platform was there when uh, it was there before my sister was killed. It was there before some of my 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 relatives were you know were left bedridden. It was there when me and other other young children you know. Uh, used to be taken outside our village to the main town, and we stayed there for almost three or four months, waiting for things to cool down. So, uh, and and the missing classes, missing uh, school lesson. You know, I wish the same platform was there, but it is not. It is not late, and uh, it, it is not too late, and it, it's working very well. It, uh, you know, it has shaped uh, how things are done in terms of social justice. You know, it's offering para uh, pa para legal services through the same channel and apart from that the, the 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 biggest success the biggest success which i can say up to date because sometimes away from uh, away from uh, away from armed violence there's another interclan there's there's another form of violence which is caused by a pastoralist community fighting over pasture and water because they look after animals they, uh, they look after livestock that is camel goat and sheep and they normally fight over meager resources that is uh, pasture and water, and that one is caused by climate change. So when that one happens, 
they go pick arm and they start uh, attacking each other. So what we did, we used the same radio platform in mobilizing communities where a community A, they come and take water on, on Monday, community B come and take water on Tuesday, the other one come and take water on, on Wednesday, and the same happened to the pasture. So we came with a, a rotational mode whereby they don't meet, they know there's no provocation and everything. And by doing so, uh, armed conflict triggered by climate change uh, of uh, meager resources also has stopped. So it's a very power, powerful platform. For us, it was a small thing, but in terms of intervention, it's, mm. it's, you know, it's quite big. That's, that's, that's incredible work, Abjata, the fact that you were able to transform, I don't mean to tra say transform, but uh, that you, you, not unlike Richard and others, that you took some of what happened to you and the emotion and, and kept asking yourself the question, what can I do, what can I do to be part of the change? And I, I don't want to say that you don't have anger, uh, but I, I, I don't hear bitterness in your voice. What I hear is like just raw action that you're, you're dedicated to making that change for your own community. And um, I was just really struck by how you kept repeating that. What can I do? What can we do? And you, also that it wasn't just about you, that you came together as a community. And then also there's the power of community media because oftentimes we're complaining about not getting heard or seen in the media or that the media are attacking our issues or our communities. But the reality is that we can create our own media in the same way that we're now transmitting our own event here all around the world with people joining us. So I think there's there's a big message in there, Abjad, about how powerful we can be when we re when we want to realize it, you know, and I think that that's so true in this issue of arm arms because when we look at the weapons manufacturing and the arms industry, it's so huge and it's so powerful and they've got lobbyists and no doubt they're paying Irish PR and lobby firms to uh, influence the agenda and the narrative and prevent who gets a counter narrative. And I have firsthand experience in that in what, what press releases get covered and what don't. But I do hear hope and power from what you're saying in that the weapons industry is something that we can take on and and should take on and that we in ireland need to listen to what you're saying that what can happen here in the same way richard was saying has a direct impact in other places around the world including near where you live yeah, well uh, i agree with you and uh, the issue of anger the, the, the point on anger uh, is uh, even uh, you know my parents my family member you know, the first thing we said is, okay, for those who killed our sister and they attacked our village and they caused a lot of misery to her, to, to, you know, to our family and to the entire villagers and the community at large, what we said is we forgive them because maybe they were driven by some other issues because there are some, you know, these are armed militias hired by, by, by clan warlords and others. So, uh, you know, they are, you know, they are being used. So what we said and the, the and what we said and the decision we reached was we forgive them and we hope that they learn from what they did. They change and they and they work with the community or they use that energy in assisting community in achieving social justice. That is the that is the you know that is the common that is the common position of not me alone but my entire family starting from uh, my father, my mother, my brothers and my sisters. And apart from that also, it, it's the same message echoed by some of my relatives who have been driven up to now from 1984 up to now without a very good care. You know, there's, a, there's no good health, health service in, uh, in Africa and Kenya, but we are trying our best in, uh, in offering, the, offering them the same. But they also said we are, we are forgiven them, you know? Uh, that's a, but the biggest thing is even the community they said one thing, how can we change things? How can we ensure the same does not happen again? That is the big thing which led me and others in coming with this initiative. And, uh, and the, the biggest complaint, and the, the biggest co complaint and the issue is the arms used by, this, by these militias, by terrorists who killed 42, 42 students in Gariza University, all these arms, you know, it, it, comes, through, it, it comes through Somalia, but the men, uh, source is Eastern Europe, and some of the arms also comes from Western Europe to, to responsible government, and it ends up in hand of wrong people through corruption, 
and yeah. uh, it contributes to massacre, mass killing, conflict rape, you know, mass displacement, and all. And all that. Uh, if Abjata's work is something that you'd like to learn more about, or indeed to get involved in supporting, Abjata is a long term partner of AFRI and his journalism and community media work with his community that AFRI directly are involved with them. So if uh, if you would like to make contact with him to get involved, and uh, I think it's always important to encourage donations. Um, it's not front and center of this event, but thank you to everyone that did donate when you were registering. And if you, it is something you want to donate to afterwards as well, it's simply www.afri.ie forward slash donate. And if you would like to earmark that for Abjata's work, that would be totally possible as well. Um, and I'll just have a final check now to just um, see, can we get his video back here? It looks like it may not be possible, which is a little bit unfortunate. Um, no. Um, no, we're going to have to move on. Um, sorry, Abjata, and sorry to everyone for that. And thanks for your patience. So. Um, we are, um, there's, there's a huge uh, Northern repre representation uh, at the event today. Um, we've, uh, we've had, um, what have we had? We've had, well, plenty of Ulster counties, if I include myself as a Cavan man as well. Um, we have a Donegal down Derry, and now we're going to go to Antrim. Hopefully, if our uh, technology holds out, um, we're going to go to uh, the Peace House in Belfast. I know many people here have been really looking forward to hearing uh, Mairead Maguire, who, of course, is well known as a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. And I would go as far as to say she's well known, but she's not as well known as I think she should be because her story is absolutely incredible. And some of the people we're hearing from today are absolute heroes and heroines and the people that we need to be celebrating more in life. So um, hopefully now we will have a direct link to Belfast into the Peace House and the unmute button will work without any issue. And I'll I'll keep a wee eye out for Abjata if we get to say cheerio to him as well, because that was a bit of an abrupt ending, unfortunately. Um, and now, Mairead, how are you? Can you hear us all right? And can we hear you? Yes, indeed, Rory. I can hear you very well. Um, brilliant, brilliant. The, the, <laughs> we tech, the We Tech Gremlins got involved with us there for a while, but um, such is life in, in the modern world. Um, so, Mairead, um, you're joining us from the Peace House. Can you tell me a little bit about the Peace House? Because I have to say it's not somewhere I'm familiar with and I feel I should be. Well, the Peace House is on the Lisburn Road in Belfast and we opened way back in 1977 and we are a small movement, but um, we have a big board outside saying demilitarization. We have to demilitarize. So we are focusing on demilitarization. Uh, and non-violence, of course. Um, so that's why I was very happy to be invited to be part of the Swords uh, into Plowshares group that started, who are calling for disarmament and peacemaking. Um, and, and that's what we do from here with our small peace movement, but uh, we are both local and international. Well, look, at I don't think the word small uh, necessarily is any signifier of uh, lack of impact because, uh, as you well know, uh, small actions can lead to great change. And I suppose I, I'm curious to get into the founding of Peace People. But before that, um, I was reading up a little bit more about you, Mairead, and I was fascinated to learn that you were a very active volunteer in uh, your teenage years in your local community going around and getting involved in your local community. And so was that kind of sensibility of citizenship and participation and civic action, was that something you grew up with or were you sort of born like that? Or what, what, what were the, some of the influences? Well, I'm very deeply grateful that when I was 14 years of age, I joined the Catholic lay organization because at that time, being 14, uh, the age has changed now, I was, too young for boys and too old for toys. Mm. So, so I joined the Legion of Mary and through that uh, focus on um, lay involvement and trying to work in one's community. Um, and that spiritual formation was very important to me because I believe what we are 
and courage to do today is look at both the political solution, but the spiritual solution. Mm -hmm. And to me, if we don't have the spirit of compassion, of love, forgiveness, of reconciliation, of, the, of a world community needing to solve our problems together, mm -hmm. um, then I don't think we're going to get out of this mad military industrial um, a complex that we're trapped in, literally. Mm, yeah. So I do think that Ireland has that message to the world because coming out of Northern Ireland after 30 years of violent conflict and suffering and trying to solve it through military, we had to acknowledge we have to do this through non-violence. That's, that's very interesting, Mairead, because... Um, that uh, that idea of a, almost like a I don't know you didn't use the word spiritual revolution but like a spirituality of peace to work for peace you know in a sense it has to come from the inside out doesn't it and you know we mentioned Desmond Tutu earlier and I think the Dalai Lama was mentioned as well and the other person's coming to mind is is um, is Martin Luther King and the idea of the beloved community regardless of you having a faith or a religion or or none of that the idea that we can have a, a human spirit and um, that we work together because we believe in a better version of humanity than the one that's been offered us or indeed forced upon us well i think this is very important because i've just finished a book by the about the dalai lama and bishop tutu great friends of richard moore <laughs> uh, and it was called joy. And it was all about, you could feel the joy coming off the pages. And they were saying, yes, we have problems, huge problems as a human family, but we can solve these problems through love, through respecting each other. And you know, you don't need to be religious in, in, in that sense that you need to know that in each human person, there is the spirit of love and the possibility that we can solve our problems without killing each other, without murdering each other, without torturing each other. But we have to say as a human family, we're not afraid. We uphold the right for every single man, woman and child not to be killed. And we have not to be afraid. We mustn't allow our governments to say that we have arms that are going to protect us. Look around the world, arms, nuclear weapons, wars, they leave behind them heartbreak and, and tragedy with so many families. But we can do this another way. Mm -hmm. And Ireland's message to the world should not be letting American soldiers go through the lack of Shannon. It should not be denying its neutrality and selling its soul at the United Nations in order to be the flavor of the month. Ireland is letting its people down by denying its neutrality. And in Northern Ireland, when the Good Friday Agreement was signed, everyone, including the Irish government, the British government, the, the different paramilitary groups, we all signed on to solve our problems through dialogue and negotiation. What have they done? They sold that down the river. People must stand up and hold their word. We rejected violence when we signed the Good Friday Agreement and the Irish people rejected violence when they signed on for neutrality. They did not sign up to be part of the military industrial complex. I have been to a lot of countries in the world that had that pleasure. I, as privilege as a Nobel laureate. And you know, everywhere the problem is violence. Violence. It is time militarism. We have to abolish militarism. We need the money out of militarism to feed the hungry, to take care of the poor, to do education. The way our governments are now militarizing Europe, we're going down the road of Europe becoming part of the military industrial act, uh, 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 allegiance and we're asked to pay for it and you know here in the streets of Belfast there's people going to food banks 
I mean, if Bridget was here today, how angry she would be that people go to food banks and can't turn on the heating to warm the little children because the money is going to nuclear weapons and war and militarism, and we're accepting it. Where's the voice of the people to say, no, feed the hungry, take care of the poor, get them houses, get them off the streets. Where's the Irish voice in this? Because if we have anything to say to the world, it must surely be what Bridget Patrick Columkill talked about, peace, peace, disarmament. And we're, we're remaining silent. We're bound down to all this nonsense of not being able to talk to each other, work with each other, challenge policies. It's not about the politicians as much as the policies. The policies have to change. And the policy must be, first and foremost, feed the hungry, take care of the poor. We don't need hungry people in a rich world. So violence, violence is the enemy. The violence of dehumanization. We're allowing our, our societies to become dehumanized. And who tells us we must be enemies to the Russian people? I was in Russia years ago. They are good people. They want peace. We must not allow any more wars, false wars. And, and after I was in Iraq when I seen over half a million young children died in Iraq of starvation in absolute agony because the United Nations of the UN and America decided they would put on punch sanctions to punish young kids. It's not acceptable. It's not good enough. We have to take a stand or civilization will get destroyed. Very well said, Marid. Um, I see that the comments here are lighting up um, about the, the, the energy and the inspiration that you're bringing. But I suppose I, I'd probably suggest that it's not even good enough for t us to be inspired by you, Marid. We have to actually get out here and, and make our voices heard. Like, you know, we can't be dependent on, on you to do the work for us or AFRI to do the work for us. We need to get vocal, don't we? We need to actually get out and rattle rattle that cage and I, I was really struck by what you said about um, the United Nations seat you know the idea that Ireland advocated for that and indeed put millions into getting that seat um, but at the expense of um, the the Palestinian people because we we kind of have since sold them out and I suppose it really is about who we are as a people and what kind of island we want what do we want to be known as are we are we fearless? Are we courageous? Are we even independent enough to be out in the, in the stage uh, having an independent Irish voice uh, that you've espoused so powerfully over the years? So thank you for, for all you've done and continue to do, Mairead. Uh, can I, just on a, I'm curious on a personal level, like how, how do you keep your, your fire lit? What fuel are you using there? Is it briquettes or what is it? Because your, your fire is very, very much burning and it's, it's no accident that, um, you know, Rita was here with the Bridget's flame and you mentioned Bridget and you were like, if Bridget was here with the flame and I was going, Jesus, Bridget is here because you were, you were really holding that flame alive. People are great. I've traveled the world and I've been so inspired by people. They're so, so good. And young people are fabulous. We have to encourage and thank them for all they do. And you know, but I once said to Mother Teresa, I had the privilege of meeting her. And I said to her mother, what is your secret? Can you give us any advice in the peace movement? It was in the height of the troubles. And I thought she was going to write as a brilliant constitution, but she quite very simply said, Oh, pray. Pray all the time. Never cease to pray. So I do believe that Bridget and Patrick and Colum Kell, Ireland has a tradition and a responsibility to say to the world that there is another way other than militarism and, and nuclear weapons and war. There's another way. Peace is possible. And Irish people have that message and we mustn't lose that message. And that message has to go to the European Parliament. 
It has to go to the American government and the Russian government. We don't want your weapons of war. We want your ideas on how we solve poverty and, and, and so many other problems, climate change and all that. We want people of vision who have ideas, not the old ideas of going to war. We've done all that and it doesn't work. We want new ideas. What's your new idea? If you can show me your new idea, good on you. If you can show me your weapons of war, well, anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or is your new thing? It's it's I'm really uh, I I really struck the fact that we've so many northern voices here today and incredible voices and the voices that we need I'd love to have on our TV, but unfortunately we have other voices. Um but but there's such stunning wisdom and depth and memory, living memory in the north for the work of peace. And it really strikes me that there can be such a hopeful vision for the work and the message from the what the world over the Northern Ireland was known for injustice and conflict. But perhaps there can be a beacon now where, you know, these voices of Tommy and Richard and yourself and all the Northern peaceful voices that that Ireland can be the peace island and to, to really seize this moment. When the world needs a, a, when the world needs an ambassador or a voyager or an advocate in a country that's prepared to stand up, do you have that sense for the north and for Belfast and for everything everyone's been through? I have that sense for so many places, and your program was very inspiring. All the different speakers, but you know, in Northern Ireland, we have a deep, deep ethnic political problem. And we've never been able to solve that problem of bringing the people together here to build a cooperation and dialogue and solve the problem together based on love, because without love, we won't solve our problems. But if we can solve our problem through dialogue, through negotiation, this deep ethnic problem, we can say to people who are in ethnic conflicts, which is happening all over the world, uh, look, we, we did it and, and we continue to do it. We're not there yet. We have a long way to go. But the first step is recognizing that every human life is sacred and we can solve our problems. We don't need to kill each other. And, you know, Patrick once said, in Christ, there is no killing. He didn't believe in killing. All around the world, there are people who don't believe in killing. We have got to do educate people towards non-violence, non, -violence, non uh, ways of solving our problems without killing each other. Yeah. Um, and stop this nonsense of spending our best brains and so much of our money on building weapons where we can perfect the horror of killing each other. It's crazy. So I do hope that young people and women Women raise their voices to say, we are the bearers of life, but we will not stand by and allow people to create weapons that are going to destroy our universe, our communities, our families. My sister Anne, who adored her children, lost three of her little children in the troubles in Northern Ireland, and she herself, with a broken heart, could not go on with her life. That's the cost of war. And we have to say no more. When I was in Iraq, half a million children under the age of five Iraqis died because we had the arrogance in the West to not only put on sanctions that killed their children, but then to create war on fake information as it was, it was taken. Then we went to uh, Syria, the Korean War. Then we went to other countries to create war. No more fake wars. We will not have fake wars. We want peace. And we challenge those in authority, particularly the American government and NATO, 
We do not want NATO and your wars destroying our brothers and sisters in third world countries. It's not on. We're not accepting it anymore. We will not kill. We will commit our lives to working for peace, but we will not support NATO, America, the UK, the hypocrisy of the UK government. They are sending weapons to Yemen to destroy our country. Made, made in London and made in Belfast. Where are those weapons going? They're going to third world countries to destroy their people. And then we have the arrogance to say, well, maybe we'll give you a little bit of international aid. Hip hypocrites. It's not good enough when children are dying in countries. We are killing them. And for Ireland to allow Sherman to be used by thousands and thousands of American soldiers to go through Sherman, armed to the teeth to drop bombs on third world countries. And Ireland says, it's nothing to do with us. I feel ashamed that the Irish government have allowed this to happen. And when I go down the channel and I see them sending weapons of war, do you know Shannon just the other week allowed American planes to go through Shannon to go off to the Middle East to prepare to start fighting the wars again against in, uh, for, from Ukraine and against Russia. Those planes went through Dublin, went through Shannon, and they, we were silent. We don't need hypocrisy in our governments. We need courage and we need truth. And we need the Irish government sitting in the Security Council to be calling for neutrality. Ukraine could be neutral and then we don't need wars. Ireland is a neutral country. The vast majority of people here in Ireland do not want these wars. And we don't want a war in South, South Sea China now. America sailing down to, to, to circulate China, and I've been down there. I've seen the new bases they're building, mm. and they're circulating there. Two wars are on the agenda from Washington now with the NATO and America. We don't want these wars, mm. not in our name. I think that's a powerful note to, to end on, Mairead, is that ultimately it is not in our name and, and it's up to us to, to make that known and to get out there and, and, and stop it and agitate and advocate. And so, listen, thanks so much for for sharing um, some of your wisdom and insight and more so your passion and raw energy that is absolutely booming through the Zoom screen here. Um, it's, it's just phenomenal to behold, Mairead. I thank you for that great light and the great flame that you continue to hold as an example of somebody that so tirelessly worked for peace and continues to do so. And I'd encourage everyone to take that message forward, bring it out into your communities, take it to your local councillors, to your TDs, your MPs, your MEPs, and to get out there and, and shake it and make people, make them know that not in our name, as you so rightly said. So thank you again, Mairead, and I encourage everyone to to check out the, the Peace House there and to offer whatever support might be needed as well. Thank you, Mairead. Rory, might I just say before you finish, well, first of all, thank you to everybody and to Afri, but may I also say, I want to ask the forgiveness of the people of Iraq, losing all their little children, all those heartbreaks, and the other countries where these fake wars were carried out. Please forgive us in the West for what we have done and how we've abused our best talents and our resources uh, and, and, and making war and weapons. Forgive us, please. Thank you, Mairead. And you, you did make that link with Shannon Airport that over two million troops have gone through. And I'm, I'm actually, it's only 50 minutes away from me right now down in the South County Clare. There's, um, you know, it's still going on as we speak and encourage people to check out a group called Shannon Watch that are documenting a lot of the flights coming in and out of Shannon. So listen, thanks again, Mairead. And uh, we look forward Thank to hopefully much. having you at a, an in-person event in the near future.
Thank you. Take care. <laughs> and and, and just, Marie, before you go, I'll just say there's so much admiration and love and respect and gratitude being shared for you in the chat facility. Uh, somebody mentioned that it's been 50 years since you, 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 maybe you were at a conference or something in Bangkok. But anyway, there's lots of messages coming through. I won't get to them all. Thanks, Mairead. Take thank care. you very much. Okay, folks. So we're pretty much towards the end now. And thank you again for everyone for staying the course with us. Please don't go yet because we have um, a little kind of special treat to wrap up with. The donate link is www.afri.ie forward slash donate. Uh, but most people did donate already, and that's hugely grateful. I want to say a huge thanks to all our speakers and to Tommy for the music. And I just can't thank you all enough. It's, it's been phenomenal. And to everybody who has joined us from all around the world, I'm probably going to forget some part of my housekeeping duties, but to, to cover my ass, so to speak, I'm going to ask Joe from Afri back on and he can also wrap things up and to bring Tommy back, who will be singing us out as well. So we have a lovely, another song from Tommy to, to end this beautiful event and uh, to thank, thanks again to everyone. Great. Well, thanks a million, Rory. I think you thanked everybody but yourself. So, um, yeah, and I think you do a fantastic job. And really, since after we were forced to go online two years ago, Rory has been our man at the helm, our, our social media expert, and he handles it so well each time that he keeps on getting the job, whether he likes it or not. So thanks a million to you, Rory. And also, as you mentioned, Rog and Larissa in the background, the AFRI team, a brilliant team to work with and to, to have the support of. And, and you know, it, make, it makes AFRI what, what it is. Uh, just as well to thank our partners, uh, Carja Bridge, the Bridgeting Sisters, and St. Patrick's in Kiltegan, uh, always generously support us and collaborate with us. I'm really grateful for that support. Also for Concern and for Trokra and for Irish Aid. Um, this event is part funded by Irish Aid and we really acknowledge their support. And it's one of the reasons I suppose like we're so grateful and proud of the work that Irish Aid does. And I think it all the more underlines the error and the stupidity of another wing of government undermining their work by promoting the arms industry. We really hope this message will, will get through um, I, I was struck as well by many things during today, but especially by, by Abjata's question, what can we do, what can we do? He kept on asking himself that question after the horrific experiences that he had, um, and, and he turned that horrific experience into a positive one. Um, and he there in uh, northern Kenya is trying to pick up the pieces that the weapons industry leaves behind. We can do our part in that by at least stopping the Irish government's decision to get involved in this industry. Let us help Abjata and his community and many other communities around the world who will be visited by the weapons that are made in Ireland. So I really appeal to all of you people who are present at this, don't, uh, this, this event above all is about action. So take action and contact your TDs, let them know that this is not going to happen without our resistance, without our shop shouting stop. Um, so thank you for that. And I, yeah, I think that's that's everything. It's um, the, the Downing Street Declaration, Joe, is uh, or not the Downing Street Declaration. God, I'm I, 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 I done so I done so well right to the final <laughs> minute here. Uh, the Down Patrick uh, Declaration. It's I think it's downpatrickdeclaration.com. Right, there's yeah. a video and a, a website, and Raj has shared that in the Zoom chat, and we will share those links again. And I see so many comments in the chat. We we couldn't get to them all so uh, as i say but um we will be reading back over them as well so um thanks again to everybody and uh to all the wonderful speakers it's, it's been it's been an amazing uh really really heartful event and uh, i for one i'm going off uh feeling much richer and energized from it and i'm very grateful to everyone yeah, that's fantastic. And yeah, the Down Patrick Declaration was launched by Mairead. We, we were privileged to have Mairead launched in, in uh, Down Patrick itself. And that's something that we're going to keep on uh, promoting. You know, it, it, it relates to the 1st of February, it relates to 17th of March, it relates to 
the 8th of November, I think is, is Colin Gillis Day. I'm, I'm probably wrong on that, but there are at least three opportunities to promote it and we will keep on promoting that idea. Really, it's about disarmament and demilitarization, which is urgently needed, as Marit said. And in doing that, I'll hand over. Uh, Tommy was meant to be with us in Down Patrick. Uh, the, we had a storm, so that wasn't possible. But he sent us two extraordinary songs, which I have listened to, one of which we have heard already today, and another beautiful song called Daughters and Sons. And I think Tommy will perform that for us now. So thank you, Tommy. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here and to be inspired by such great people. Lovely to see Murray there as well. And uh, this song is a celebration of people who work hard during their lifetime to make the world a better place for their daughters and sons. Not by waving a, an uneatable flag of freedom, but to get freedom from hunger, freedom to breathe clean air, drink clean water, freedom from violence and inequality. I wouldn't hear your music on the pull your paintings down. I wouldn't read your writing and the band you from the town. But they couldn't stop you dreaming and a victory you've won. You sowed the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. You sowed the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons. I don't know your religion, but one day I heard you pray for a world where everyone can work and children they can play. And though you never got your share of the fruits that you've won, you sowed the seeds of equality in your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. You sow the seeds of equality in your daughters and your sons. They taunted you in Belfast, tortured you in Spain, and in that Warsaw ghetto where they tied you up in chains. In Vietnam and Chile, when they came with tanks and guns, there you sow the seeds of peace. Your daughters and your sons sing it with me. In your daughters and your sons, in your daughters and your sons. It's there you saw the seeds of peace in your daughters and your sons. And now your music's playing and the writing's on the wall. And all the dreams you painted can be seen by one and all. And now you've got them thinking the future's just begun. For you sowed the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. You sowed the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons. Wonderful, Tommy. Wonderful. Garamila Mahagut. Thank you so much, Tommy. Uh, and Garamila. Have you any gigs coming up before we go? Uh, I have a few here. That, well, I'm doing a German tour, hopefully, in, in May. And uh, Are you awesome. looking for a Baron player? <laughs> oh, no, 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 there's a thing. You're uh, doing the Baron player. Uh, listen, I, hopefully I'll get to see you play soon anyway, Tommy. Thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. And, and, and if you do have any Irish gigs, please, everyone, check out Tommy and go and buy multiple copies of his CD and support all Irish independent music where you can. Thank, Thank you. you, Tommy. Okay, folks, so that is a wrap and um, we are now concluded and I just want to say a final thank you to all. Wish you all a wonderful evening or whatever time zone you're in. 
And um, the next big AFRI event will be the uh, Famine Walk in um, the third Saturday in May, hopefully in Lewisburg County, Mayo. It's a big annual event and there will be some other events and ongoing campaigns in the meantime. So stay tuned, social media, website, email newsletter, all that kind of stuff. And uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand back to Raj now, who's going to play out just a final video, which is really just a reflection video. So the, the event is now ended. I hate this bit because I never know how to say goodbye. And uh, it's like an abrupt, you know, I feel like somebody should just pull the plug on me or something like that. But anyway, I'm done. Good luck. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>